What is up guys? Welcome back to my channel. My name is David Hanlon, aka The Laptop Legend, and I'm making this video to explain how you can get into day trading if you have absolutely zero prior knowledge. And a lot of you guys have been messaging me and asking me a bunch of questions that like, I feel like could be answered by a video like this. So I think this is really gonna be helpful for all you beginners who want to get in and start learning about trading stocks and doing what I do because I post some pretty impressive profits. Honestly, I'm so blown away by the profits I've had this month. It was a record month for me and I closed in over $80,000 in profits just in the month of February. So I'm so, so grateful that I've been able to have that type of success. And I'm so grateful that I've been able to help so many of you have similar success. So that's the goal of this video. In this video, I'm gonna talk about every little thing. And I've seen a lot of other videos where they dive into the vocabulary and don't really explain the minute details and just assume that you already know stuff. So my goal in this video is to talk about every little thing and not leave anything out, not assume you know any vocabulary, not, not give you any jargon you've never heard of before. And the other thing is, I've seen a lot of these videos where they talk about some of the stuff, get you hooked, and then try to sell you on like a two or $3,000 course. That is not the purpose of this video either. I don't have any type of stock trading course. I'm literally just making this video to help you guys out if you're a beginner. So all that I ask in return is that if you find this video helpful, you smash that like button down below, subscribe if you have not already, Leave a comment. I mean, you can say anything. You could comment, you know, pork chops if you want. Go ahead and comment pork chops. I'm fine with that. Any type of comment will help out this channel. Subscribe again. And then share this video with your friends if you have anyone else who wants to get into day trading and they don't know where to start or they don't they don't really know much about the stock market because sharing this video also helps my channel grow and that, that's literally all I ask in return. No $3,000 course. I'm putting all this information in here for free. So I'm gonna be using this uh, iPad here just to make sure that I don't miss out on anything. I wanna make sure I explain everything that you guys need to understand. And uh, yeah, so let's dive into my computer and I'm gonna use that to show you guys some more visuals to help you understand what I'm talking about a little bit better. So let's go do that now. All right guys, so I'm here at my laptop and this is just a screenshot that I took of Fidelity. I'm using iMovie right now to edit so I can't put multiple pictures on top of videos, which is why I can't show you live uh, screen recording of this because I wouldn't be able to block out the account number here. But again, if you want to see my verified trades, there's a link down in the description on Profitly. So just so you know, I'm not lying. This is my uh, monthly profits and I'm not showing you this to flex. I'm showing you this to show you what is possible as well as to provide a little bit of uh, credibility, I guess, you know, so you know that you're learning from someone who actually knows what they're talking about. Um, so if we continue on here, I just want to talk about first, first off, um, what is a stock? What is a share? And uh, why do companies issue shares. So literally, I'm assuming you know absolutely nothing. So let's get into it. So this is typically, you know, back in the old days, what a share of a company would look like. And uh, this is, I guess this is actually 100 shares. And companies issue shares to raise money for the company. And there's, I mean, there's a couple different ways that companies can raise money, but the main two ways are with debt and with equity. Equity is by issuing shares and debt is typically with like bonds and stuff like that. So by buying shares, you essentially own a small percentage of the company. So say I created a company, David Hanlon uh, Incorporated, and I had 100 shares. You could buy one of those shares and you would technically you know, have the rights to 1% of that company. And that, that's, that's just a small explanation of how it works. And uh, typically what happens is these shares come with voting rights and potentially access to dividends. Now, dividend is money that the company earns through its, you know, through its profitable ventures, and it pays back out to the shareholders. Not all companies do this. Typically, companies only do this if they are older, they're no longer growing super quickly, and they don't have a good use for all that extra profit. They can't put that into growing the company because the company's already so big, so they give that back to the shareholders. If a company is in the growth stage, they typically don't pay out any type of dividends. Now, uh, let's see. Stock is, yeah, again, stock is also called equity, and there's also different types of stocks, um, different types of stock. There's preferred stock, and there's common stock. Typically, what you and I would be buying is a common stock, and preferred stock can either, you know, come with more dividends, it can come with higher dividends, it can have more voting rights, etc. and it's just like a premium version of the common stock. Now, why would you invest in a stock versus investing in a bond? Well, bonds for the company, they give a guaranteed percentage and say you might you know give a company a hundred dollars and then you get back five percent a year for 10 years and then at the end of that you get your hundred dollars back that's typical of what a bond would be now if the company is growing really fast you could get a lot more than five percent a year by buying the stock in the company which is why stockholders you know shareholders are rewarded more handsomely but in the event of bankruptcy 
Stockholders are the last people to get paid. So if there's any money remaining, they'll get it, but everyone else gets paid before the common shareholders. So if you buy a bond, you're gonna get your money before if they have to liquidate all the assets, which is kind of what you know makes shareholders have more risk, but potential reward. And the market is like that in general. If you have more risk, there's more potential reward. So the riskier the investment, the more potential reward there is. Now, why would you buy shares of a company? Well, there's two main reasons. Number one is investing. And this is based on the fundamental aspects of the company. And typically you believe that it will succeed long-term. It will continue to grow. It's gonna have more and more income, more revenues. The business will keep expanding and uh, you believe in the management team, etc. So that's the fundamental aspects of the company. And again, that is investing. Typically this is on a more long-term scale because you know if you, if you put in $100 into this company now, imagine what it's gonna be in 10 years. If you, if you bought Amazon back in, you know, 2000, I mean, wow, that was an insane growth because the company absolutely exploded. And that was a great company to invest in. Now, the other type of reasons you would buy shares of a company is for trading purposes. And this is not based on fundamental. You don't look at the revenues of the company. You don't care about any of that stuff, which might seem counterintuitive, but all you care about is the technical factors. So again, there's fundamental, which is based on revenue, management team, et cetera, the industry, all that stuff, that's fundamental. And then there's technical, which is just based off of the price movement of the stock itself, what the chart looks like, all the indicators, all the averages, stuff like that. And uh, this is what I personally do for the most, I guess probably, probably 99% of what I do is trading, where I don't look at the fundamentals at all. Occasionally, if I see a really good company I want to invest in, I'll do that long term. But almost exclusively, I do trading. And I do day trading where I'm in and out within the day. So if I buy a stock, I'm selling it that same day, almost always. And uh, this can be on a variety of time frames. It could be, you know, from 10 seconds. Or, you know, technical trades could honestly go for months. If you see a chart pattern that looks good and you want to buy it and you think it's going to go up long term, you could do that just based on the price action of the stock, not thinking, you know, that it's going to be incredible. All right, so now that you guys know what shares of a company are and, you know, the two different ways you can profit on that, why you would buy shares of a company based on fundamental or technical analysis, uh, let's talk about the different types of exchanges that these stocks can trade on. Now, there's two main big listed exchanges and this is where typically speaking companies want to be traded on because this is where the biggest most reputable companies trade on within the united states now obviously there's other stock exchanges outside the u.s but i'm, I'm just speaking purely from a usa perspective now the main two ones are the nasdaq and the new york stock exchange nyse and uh what's great about these is that they are more reputable they bring access to much larger investors and in order to be listed, companies have to meet certain requirements in terms of revenue, share price, number of shareholders, accounting practices, etc. And these stocks typically have far more liquidity and far more volume. Now, I'm gonna explain what both of those things mean. So liquidity is the ability to get in and out of your investment quickly. So an example of a liquid investment would be a stock. You can buy it and you can sell it online within you know, five seconds if it's trading on the NASDAQ. Okay, super liquid. An example of an illiquid investment would be a house. Now, houses can be more liquid, you know, depending on the market, but you can't sell a house in five seconds. You know, it can take more time. Sometimes it can take up to months to get your money out of that house. So that's an example there. Volume is how many shares are traded daily of a stock. And if a stock has, you know, a billion volume in a day, you can imagine it's easier to get in and out with size. If you want to buy a million shares and it trades a billion shares on the day, you can probably buy a million shares with no issue. But if a stock is only trading 2 million shares on the day and you want to buy a million, you are half the volume on that day and you're going to affect the price a lot more. So you just have to keep that in mind. Now, because of this liquidity and because of this volume on these two exchanges, there are far bigger players in the market. So when you're trading stocks like this, a lot of times you're facing off against hedge funds. Those are, you know, people who have billions and billions of dollars in assets that they manage for people. You're facing off against institutional investors. I mean, again, people with billions of dollars. You're facing off against algorithmic trading, literally computers that buy and sell based on the price action. So it's typically a lot more difficult to be profitable because you are a tiny fish 
in a very, very big pond. And this is why I haven't had a lot of success trading listed stocks. And again, if it's called a listed stock, it means it's listed on one of these. Most of these are more well-established companies uh, and are typically less sketchy companies because again, they have a, a lot more listing requirements to meet. The accounting practices are a lot more difficult. So you're, you're not gonna find you know disgusting, completely scammy companies on here. There, there is at least some minimum you know, basic standards that they have to meet. That's not to say that every company on the NASDAQ or the New York Stock Exchange is an incredible company that's worth putting your money into, but it, it just goes to show that you're not gonna have like, I don't know, your dad cooking some burgers in his basement on the New York Stock Exchange. Like it, it would never get up to that point. And uh, these, again, these are more well-established companies typically, and depending on what types of stocks you're trading, the more you get up, you're gonna have like huge market cap stocks. Market cap is the overall worth of the company, which is just taken by the total shares times the price per share. That's the market cap of the company. So say there's a million shares trading at a dollar a share, that's a million dollar market cap. So if you get like a trillion dollar market cap company, typically speaking, these companies are more well established. People agree more on the price of the company, the value of the company, and their share price is not gonna fluctuate that much. So, you know, the typical year in the S&P 500, if I go here, the typical year is, uh, I think it's something like, it's like 9%. The typical year is like 9%, 8%. Historically, over the last 100 years, that's what the S&P 500 has earned. So, you know, that's, that's typical for big companies like this. If you buy Microsoft, it's never going to go up 1,000% in a year. It's just not going to happen because too many people already know what the company is worth. Everyone agrees on it pretty much. So, I mean, there's going to be small fluctuations, but overall, you're never going to get 1,000% returns investing in Microsoft. But Microsoft is a lot safer investment because it's a huge, well-established company and it's not going to go out of business tomorrow because, you know, it's, it's, it's sketchy or scammy. You know, everyone knows what the business model is already on Microsoft. So, that's kind of the difference between the New York Stock Exchange and the NASDAQ versus the other sketchier stock exchanges. Now, if I go down to that, you can see here, well, I guess you can't see this, this is in my notes, but the other option besides NASDAQ and New York Stock Exchange is unlisted. Unlisted stocks are OTC, and OTC stands for over-the-counter. Over-the-counter securities are not listed on a major exchange in the US and are instead traded via a broker-dealer network because they are smaller companies and they don't meet the requirements to be listed on one of those other two exchanges. So that they, they're unable to be listed on the NASDAQ, they're unable to be listed on the New York Stock Exchange, so they trade on the OTC. And uh, typically speaking, there's a lot more risks to OTCs because they are sketchier, they don't meet the requirements, but as I already stated earlier, when there's more risks in the investment, you have a much greater potential for return. So it's it's like equally proportional. The more risk, the more potential for return. The less risk, the less potential for return. So just keep that in mind. And uh, here's a couple of the risks of the OTC. You can see there's a lack of publicly available information. So if you're trading on the New York Stock Exchange, you have to have everything audited. You have to prove that if you say you made a million dollars or a billion dollars, you actually made that. If you're trading on the OTC, you're not going to have to do that, or at least it will be less strict depending on which you know area of the OTC you're trading on. So it makes it a lot easier to have you know fraudulent investment schemes, which makes these companies a lot more dangerous to invest in. So I always assume as a day trader, any stock that I'm trading on the OTC is a scam. And that's just a good mindset to protect you from investing your hard-earned money into a, into a company that is actually a scam. You know, there might be some great companies, but overall, it's very difficult to find them because most companies are scamming if they're on the OTC. You know, if they were insanely good companies, they would be on the New York Stock Exchange or on the NASDAQ. So you have to keep that in mind. Again, there's no minimum listing standard uh, on some of these OTCs. And then, you know, there's, there's a lot more business and financial risk. You know, if, you, if you're trading a $500 billion company, people agree a lot more on what that is. They have a lot more established business practices and they're not gonna go out of business tomorrow. Versus if you're trading a $50 million company, there's a lot more room for growth in that, but it could also go bankrupt, you know, six months from when you invest which means you would lose all your money. Because again, if you're a shareholder, you get your money last. Debt, debt holders get their money before you. Preferred shareholders get their money before you. You literally will be the last person to get a payout if the company goes bankrupt. And if a company like this goes bankrupt, you're not getting a dime. 
Now, this is actually on the Swaz website, but you can see here, there's, there's different standards of uh, OTC. So OTC QX, this is the highest tier of the OTC markets based on the amount of available information. So there's actually some more strict requirements to be on here. You have to uh, you know, be current on all the regul regulatory disclosures, you have to have audited financials, which is a big deal. And if you don't know what that means, that means you have a separate outside company come in and verify that you're actually making what you say you're making. So audited financials are a big deal in the OTC land because a crappy company is not going to be able to have audited financials that prove it makes millions of dollars because it doesn't. You know, that's like a, an unbiased third party coming in and saying they actually make what they say they make. So this is uh, this is the highest tier. The next one down is OTCQB, and this is designed, again, for early stage or growth companies. They have to have a minimum bid price of one penny, so stocks can actually trade for less than that. So they have to have a minimum bid price of one penny, and uh, there's a couple other things you can see here. They, they, they have to meet some of these standards. The next level below that is pink market. These are pink sheets, and... Uh, there are no minimum financial standards and it can include a wide variety of companies, etc. So pink sheets are more dangerous than OTCQB. Oh my gosh, bro, it just keeps quitting on me. That's all right. So OTCQB is better than pink market. OTCQX is better than this. So the, the lower down you go, typically speaking, the more risky it is, but the more potential for return you have. All right, so what are some of the pros and some of the cons of the OTC market? Well, if I go over here to my notes, just to make sure I don't miss anything, OTCs, they have lower liquidity, they have lower volume, and because of this, there are less big players. Now, what does this mean? This means it's a smaller pond and you're a bigger fish. You're not competing with these massive hedge funds, you're not competing with institutional investors for the most part, and uh, it's a lot easier to make a profit when you're not competing with those huge players. You know, imagine you're, you're a boxer and you're trying, to, you're, trying to, you're trying to fight people. If you're 130 pounds, it's going to be a lot easier if you're fighting other people who are 130 pounds versus if you're trying to fight someone who's 250 pounds of solid muscle. That's how I view it. So if you're fighting in the OTC market, you're fighting with people who are more your size. And uh, again, because of the lower liquidity and lower volume, slower transactions. So if you buy, you're not going to get executed instantly. Execution is how long it takes from when you place the order to when the order actually fulfills. So if you try to buy shares on the OTC market, it could take, you know, three minutes to go through and actually buy. Or if you're trying to sell your shares, same thing. I've had trades where it took me three minutes to sell my shares. This would never, ever happen on the NASDAQ or on the New York Stock Exchange because you get instantly executed because they all go through those big exchanges. So just keep that in mind. Slower executions and uh, it's a lot more difficult. Now also, smaller dollar amounts will move the stock a lot more just because it has a lot less players in there. So if you buy $1,000 worth of a penny stock, you can move the price up significantly. If you buy $100,000, it can move it up a lot. Versus if you buy $100,000 worth of Apple, it's not gonna budge. It's not gonna make any difference. So just keep that in mind. Uh, the price is typically, for OTC stocks, typically under $1. Uh, if you get on the OTC QX or OTC QB, you know, it, it can be above that, definitely. Uh, but I would say typically, especially in pink sheets, it's typically under $1. And it can go as low as 0 .0001, which is one one hundredth of a penny. This is also called trip one, triple zero. And uh, 0 .001 can also be called dub one or double zero one. So just keep that in mind. These are very typical price points. And uh, what I like about the OTC is that it has a lot cleaner charts and the, the price movement is a lot easier to read than if you're trading a NASDAQ or New York Stock Exchange stock. So if I go here, just as an example, uh, look at Microsoft. If I zoom in, uh, let's find a day. Let's, let's, go, let's go right here. How do I zoom in here? There we go. All right, so let's, let's just zoom in and uh, look at this. You can see, I mean, it goes up, it goes down, it goes up, it goes down, up, down, up, down, up, down, up, down, up, down. This is very, very typical for a NASDAQ stock with a lot of big players in it. It's very choppy. Choppy is when it's like, there's no clear price action. It's not going up for sure. It's not going down for sure. It's just It can't really make up, make up its mind. That's what choppy is. Versus if I go to this OTC stock, look how many consecutive candles you get in a row. And I'm going to explain what candles are in a second for those of you guys who don't know. But uh, just look at this price action, guys. Look at this price action. You can see here, it goes straight down from the open at 9.30 all the way here at 9.53. So for 23 minutes, it does not go up at all. It's literally just straight down. And I mean, I guess it kind of goes up a tiny bit there, but I'm not counting that. And then right after that, it bounces beautifully. And for, what is that? For eight minutes straight, it goes straight up. 
So if you buy here, it's very obvious when to sell. You sell at the first red candle. And I love plays like this. You do not get charts this clean in the NASDAQ or New York Stock Exchange world. It just does not happen. You don't get bounces this clean. It does not happen. And these are my favorite types of setups. But I'll get into that more in a second. So I just want to show you guys the difference. Like this is such a clean chart and you do not get that in the choppiness on these NASDAQ stocks. I have no advantage trading with the big players here, but I have an advantage when I'm trading an OTC stock like this, which is how I was able to make $80,000 this month. So if I keep going down, yeah, I guess the last thing is you have a lot more risk on the OTC market, but because of that, there's a lot more potential for growth. Again, it's a lot easier for a stock that's trading at 0 0.0001 to go up, you know, 200x. If you put in $100, 200x your money, that's a lot of money. Versus if you put in $100 into Microsoft, you're never, ever going to 200x your money. Ever. It's just not going to happen. So just keep that in mind, guys. All right, so now that you know what OTC is, you know what NASDAQ is, you might be wondering, how do I buy shares in a company? You know, I see all this, I see all this movement, but what do I actually do? Like, how do I buy shares in a company? Well, you do this through a brokerage firm. This used to be a lot more difficult. You know, you used to have to go to the New York Stock Exchange and wave your hand up with a piece of paper and try to bid with people in line. Now it's so much easier with the internet. It's literally so easy. You just make an account online and you can buy shares instantly at the click of a button. I absolutely love it. Um, you also can do it versus, I mean, you can also do it with these, these trading softwares that you download. And that's what I recommend. So typically speaking, your broker or brokerage is going to have a way you can place orders online. They're going to have something on their mobile app. And then they're also going to have a more extensive platform that you can download and put on your computer. And this is what I recommend trading on because it's more robust and gives you access to more data. The more data you have, the more decisions you'll be able to make, if that makes sense. So what are the best brokerages to use? If you're getting into trading, you've probably heard of Robinhood. You've probably heard of Webull. I personally do not recommend these. And uh, I'm not going to get into why I don't like Robinhood, but they're just not a good broker. It's, it's a fact. They're not a good broker. And uh, I don't like Webull either because as of now, they don't offer OTC trading. So a lot of these, a lot of these, uh, you know, these brokerages don't allow you to trade OTC stocks, which is very frustrating because this is, in my opinion, the best opportunity for someone who wants to learn how to day trade with a small account. It's the best opportunity. You can't even do that. You can't even buy all the stocks that I trade if you have a Robinhood account. So what do I trade on? I personally trade using Fidelity. I have absolutely no referral code for them. I tried to get one, but I literally have none. So I'm just telling you about them because they're currently the broker that I use. So I definitely recommend them. I'm not a financial advisor. Let me just say that if you made it this far, I'm not a financial advisor. Uh, but yeah, I personally use Fidelity and I love them because uh, they have zero commissions for when you're trading OTC stocks. And uh, this is such a big deal if you're trading with a small account. I have a whole video on this, so I'm not going to go in super in depth. But essentially, if you have commissions, every single time you buy or sell shares of a company, you're charged a fee. And at these other companies like TD Ameritrade, which is also a good broker, or E-Trade, which is also a good broker, you're going to be paid, you're going to be paying $7, $6.95 every single time you buy or sell. So if you buy a $100 position and you buy and sell for $100, you just lost $7 times to $14. You lost 14% before you even include whatever you made on the stock or lost on the stock. So it's unsustainable for a small account, which is why I like Fidelity, because they have no commissions on OTC stocks. Absolutely love it. So I personally have Fidelity. Now, there's a couple types of accounts. There's a cash account and there's a margin account. If you're under the PDT, use a cash account. If you're over the PDT, use a margin account. You might not know what the PDT is. I have a whole video on this as well. Feel free to go watch it. The PDT is if you have less than $25,000 in your account, you can only make three trades in five business days, three day trades in five business days, if your account is under $25,000. So if your account is under $25,000, just have a cash account. Don't have a margin account. Just trust me on that one. Now, I personally trade in my Roth IRA because there's zero taxes on that. But if you want to withdraw the money before retirement, you're going to have to make an individual brokerage account, which will be taxed, but you'll be able to use the money. And again, you're going to want an individual brokerage account, but it's going to be a cash account, not a margin account. So you're not going to enable margin on your account. And I think cash is typically the default. All right, so let's say you made your Fidelity account. You know, what's next? How do I trade? What do I trade? When do I know to buy? How do I know when to buy? Etc. All right, so let's dive into some of this stuff a little bit more. And uh, there's some key terminology that I'm going to need to explain to you guys. 
So here you can see this is a candlestick graph. This is a candlestick graph. And uh, if I go here, this is what some of you guys might be using. This is a line graph. There is a lot less information that you can get from a line graph. And let me explain why. You might not understand what a candlestick graph is. You might not know how to read it, but you need to learn and it's gonna help you out so much if you learn. So a line graph only tells you uh, where the price either opens or closes. I forget exactly which one it is, but say, you know, there's a minute time frame. There's 5,000 trades that happen in that minute. It's only gonna show you the very first trade in that minute. And that's what's gonna be at the 940, then 941, etc. So you only get to know the first trade. You don't know any of the other data. So if it traded at 940, Say it was trading, you know, at two, $2.50 at 940, and then it spiked all the way up to $2.80, came down to $2, and then closed back at nine, uh, you know, at 250. You would have no idea from this line graph. But when you pull up a candlestick graph, if I go here, I go back to candlesticks. Now you can tell exactly what the price did in that minute, which is beautiful. It's so, so helpful. So you guys really need to learn candlestick graphs. So let me just explain, you know, what they are. So Here's the body of the candle, and these are the wicks. And you can see it kind of looks like a candle. You know, you can light, light a little fire here. So what this means is, if it's a red candle, the, the, like, the top part of, the, of the, uh, the base of the candle, this is where the price opened for the minute. If there's any wicks above, that's how high the price went within that minute. If there's any wicks below, that's how high the price went within that minute. That's how low the price went within that minute. And then wherever it closes, that was the last print within that minute. So I know that at 9.50, the price was 196. It went as high as 197, went as low as 170 or 181 and ended up closing at 184. Just by looking at this one little candle, which is so helpful. It gives you a lot of information. Same thing here. It's just flipped for a green candle. So the base is where it opens. The top of the body is where it closes. And then the wicks are the range within that minute. So I know it opened here at 160, 164, went as high as 180, and ended up closing at 176 on the end of that minute. And it just continues on up. And you can have candlesticks in any type of, you know, any type of, I guess, time frame. So I can change this. Right now, these are one minute candles. If I want to change this, I can make this a five minute candle. What does it look like on a five minute candle? Five days on a five minute candle. Look at that. So now these candles just got smaller. They kind of all merged into one. I could do 15 minute candles. Let's see what it looks like when I do that. So now you can see on this wick, you can see a little bit better of an idea. So this is cool. So this shows you like, these are 15 minute candles now. This shows you it opened here, it closed here, but it went all the way down and came all the way back up in that time frame. So this gives you an idea of, of why wicks are so helpful. Because again, if I switch this back to a line graph, I have no idea that it went all the way down there. I have no idea. So you need to learn candlesticks. It really helps you with the price action. Now there's a couple other things that I want to talk about as well. Uh, there's some other terms that you need to know here. And uh, let's, let's just dive right into those. So again, open is uh, typically on the day. You know, the first trade that happens on the day. That's the opening price. Close is the last trade that happens on the day. That's the closing price. And the market opens at 9.30 Eastern time and closes at 4 p.m. Eastern time. If it's a NASDAQ stock, there's going to be trades before. Actually, if it's OTC, there's trading for an hour before, but only on very special brokers. And uh, there's also after hours. Again, if I go to Microsoft, you'll be able to see a little bit better. Yeah, let's go to Microsoft real quick. So this is after hours trading, which goes until 8 p.m. Eastern time. And then uh, pre-market trading begins at 4 a.m. Eastern time. So, I mean, there, there's a lot of market hours. The main market hours, again, are only 9.30 to 4. And that's only when I trade. That's the only time that I trade. So just to give you a little idea now. So what are some other things you guys need to know about? All right, so volume. Volume is super, super important. Volume is super important. So for this, let me go back to one minute just so you guys can see a little bit better. Also, my computer sounds like a, like a wind tunnel, so I apologize for that. So volume, again, volume is the amount of shares that are traded. And you can see here on this chart, volume is something that's super, super important when you're day trading because this lets you know when there's the most amount of buyers or sellers interested at a price. And on a, on a trade like this, when it's dipping and you wanna get in at the bottom, if you see a huge spike in volume, the biggest spike in volume in the day, right at the bottom here, you know that that's 
pretty likely to be the bottom because there's so many people interested in buying at this price. You can see there's over 600,000 people. Over 600,000 people in one minute. Well, I guess not people. Over 600,000 shares were bought in this one minute candle, which is insane. There's a lot of buying down here at the bottom. And you can see it fades off midday. It fades off midday and then, you know, starts to come back in. So you can see exactly how many shares are being traded. And if there's a ton of volume, you know, it's typically a good sign that some price action is going to follow. So you got to keep in mind, these are very important things. Volume average is the average volume that trades on a stock. So if a stock has traded, uh, you know, an average volume of 10 million over the last week, and today it's at 100 million, you know it's likely to have a lot more people interested in it. It's likely to have a lot more volatility. Volatility, this is another point that I want to make. Volatility is what we need to profit as day traders. I don't care if a stock goes up. I don't care if a stock goes down. I cannot make any money if a stock flatlines because I buy it here and I sell it here. I make zero dollars. But if it goes up and goes down, I can make a lot of money on that. So volatility is the most important thing as a day trader. Uh, what are some other things here? Price to earnings. This is the price to earnings ratio. So basically how much a stock costs based on how much the company earns in profits. You can see this is negative. Typically, a good company that's you know trading at you know a decent price to earnings is going to be like a 15 price to earnings ratio. So that means for every dollar uh, you spend on the stock, the, the the company earns the equivalent of a dollar for that. Earnings per share, same thing. So you can see this company earns and I mean loses an average of seven cents a share. EPS, that's what that stands for. So just these little things to keep in mind, guys. But again, I don't really care about price to earnings. I don't care about earnings per share when I'm day trading because it's totally technical. There's nothing fundamental about it. I don't care about the profits of the company. I don't care about the revenues. I don't care about the management team. I care about none of that. I'm just reading the charts. Something that is important if you're reading the charts though is the float. And this, I would say, comes more into play in NASDAQs, but uh, it can come into play in OTCs. Now the float of the company, this is how many shares exist and are able to be traded by your average investor like you and me. And uh, this float has a direct impact on how volatile the stock is. So we see NASDAQ stocks, anything under 10 million float, uh, this is going to be really, really volatile. Anything under 10 million float is going to be really, really volatile because if you think about it, let me give you a donut example. Say I have 10 donuts and I have 10 people who want donuts. I want to sell it for a dollar. Okay, that's fine. Everyone buys donuts for one dollar. Everyone has a donut, everyone's happy. Say I have 10 donuts, but now there's 100 people. Less donuts, more people. If there's an increase in demand of the donuts, the price of the donuts is gonna go through the roof. If I decrease it to five donuts, the price of the donuts is gonna go even more through the roof. If there's only one donut, there's gonna be a massive bidding war. So it's the same type of idea. And uh, when you have OTCs, the price is a lot lower. So obviously the float doesn't matter as much. If it costs a penny, it doesn't matter. Uh, you know, the float doesn't matter as much. I've seen companies with a 4 billion float uh, that are trading at pennies be very volatile. But in general, NASDAQs, if you see under 10 million float, it's going to be very, very volatile. So this is just, you know, this is another term that you guys need to learn. I just want to explain that. Uh, let's see if there's anything else. All right. Yeah, so level two, let's talk about that. Level two would go right here. And level two quotes are basically the things that people are willing to pay for the stocks. So level two is going to show you how many shares someone wants to buy and at what price. And it's just going to go down the line. So say the stock, let's go here for an example. Say the stock is currently, currently trading at, uh, at 256. Call it currently trading at 256, right? There's going to be someone who's willing to buy it at 255. And you can see that on level two. It'll say, this dude is willing to buy 1,000 shares at 255. And you'll be able to see the guy below him. This guy's willing to buy 2,000 shares at 254. And you can see down at 250, someone's willing to buy 10,000 shares. All that's going to show up on the level two, which can give you a lot of insight into what is happening. And I really, really like this. I have a whole video on how I use level two, so I'm not going to go super in depth to that, but just, just check it out. Time and sales, this shows you every single transaction that takes place. And this is very helpful as well because it tells you the price and it tells you all the volume that's going through. So if someone buys a million shares, you're going to see it on the time and sales and you're going to know that, man, there's probably a big move incoming if someone just bought a million shares. Just keep that in mind. If it's red, it means they're buying, I mean, they're, they're selling onto the bidders. And if it's green, it means they're buying onto the sellers. Again, the price is literally just the last price that was traded. There is no specific price for a stock. All it is is a wall of sellers 
and a wall of buyers and whatever the price is, is just bouncing between them. The walls move up and down. That's how prices work on stocks. All right, guys, so let's keep going. So if you're not trading based on the fundamentals, you know, based on what the revenues for the company are gonna be, then how do you know when to get in? That's something you're probably, probably a lot of you are asking. So there's two main factors that I look for. Number one is support and resistance. And the other thing, number two, is momentum riding. So support and resistance is based on the chart of the stock. And you'll learn to recognize this, but essentially support and resistance are levels within the chart that stocks or the prices, you know, the shares tend to bounce off of. And I have a really good example for you here. And again, this can be on any type of time frame. It can be on one year, it can be intraday, etc. The longer a price is held up for, uh, the, the better the resistance, the stronger it's likely to be. So you can see here, uh, this is PLNHF. And this is a absolutely beautiful trade that I recommended taking. You know, I talked about this trade on my YouTube channel a while back. And you can see here, it could not break out past this $4 level. And I just drew a line here so you guys can see. It could not break out past this wall. It tried once, it failed, it rejected. It came back up, it tried again. It failed, it rejected. It came back up, it tried again. It failed and rejected. But when it was finally able to actually break out past four, this is called a breakout through resistance. Look at this run that it went on. Look at this run that it went on. I mean, it, it literally went straight up from four all the way up to, to 620. And I sold on this day right here. And then it consolidated for a while, couldn't break above those levels. And then as soon as it did, it went on another run all the way up to 860. So you can just see, this is the type of support and resistance that I look for intraday. So if I see a stock that can't break out past a, a level, especially a whole dollar level, that's a whole nother concept, but these psychological levels like $1, $2, $3, $4, etc., or the half mark, 50 cents, etc., 25, all of those are psychological numbers. And when those align with the chart resistance, it tends to have a really nice breakout when it goes past that. So I like buying breakouts. That's one of the strategies that I do. But buying breakouts means you're buying at a high price because it could just reject there. You know, it's rejected the first three times. So what happens if it just goes slightly above and then breaks back down under? That would stink to be buying at the highest price. You know, it's better to buy at the lowest price, right? Buy low, sell high. That's what everyone thinks. So that's why this is a little bit more dangerous. So I prefer momentum riding. And uh, momentum is just trying to ride lots of buying or selling volume. And my favorite is on a panic dip buy, like this one that I already showed you guys. So this is a panic dip buy, and I love getting in right here when it just starts to turn and then riding this momentum up and selling into this big spike. That is my favorite trade of all time, buying panic dip buys. And uh, I also like buying stocks right after news is released. So I mean, this, this could be a very typical chart, you know, say, say the stock opens right here, and then news is released right here. This is, you know, you can see a huge green spike like this, especially on an OTC stock with no red candles and you sell as soon as you see a red candle. That's what I love. So riding this momentum, this is the best way in my opinion to make money in the stock market. Riding momentum on OTC stocks and getting in right on these panic dip buys when the momentum is shifting. And the more you practice this stuff, the better you'll be at understanding, being able to figure out when it's actually shifting the momentum. But this is why I love it. <clears throat> so, I guess one more thing. Yeah, I, I, so I have a lot of videos talking about how I do this, so I'm not gonna go super in depth on this right now, but this is, this is just to let you know what my favorite pattern is and how I made the majority of the $80,000 that I made this month. Um, so I, again, I have a lot of videos. I have some live videos where I do live dip buys, et cetera, so I definitely recommend checking those out after this video. Why do stocks bounce like this? Why do they see such insane bounces? Well, there's a couple reasons, and I don't wanna get into all of them super in depth, but essentially, you could profit from a stock going down if you short it, which is where you sell it before you buy it. So you borrow shares from someone, you sell it, and then you have to buy it back. And whenever people buy shares, it pushes the price up. So if there's a ton of people who shorted and then they buy shares back, the price is gonna bounce up because they're buying those shares back. And momentum traders hop on, etc. So it basically creates a big bounce typically whenever there's a big sell-off. So if you get a bunch of red candles in a row, there's almost always a nice bounce that comes after it at some point because shorts cover and then momentum traders hop on. So literally, I make my money from patterns like this. Does it sound too good to be true? Well, it is, and here's why. You're fighting against a lot of factors. It's not as simple as, oh, I see a stock going down, let me buy it, and wow, I'm rich. I just made $80,000 this month. No, it is not that easy at all, because again, you're fighting against so many factors that are trying to make you unprofitable. So it's your job to make sure you fight and overcome all those factors. 
Let me just go into some of them. So fake outs, you know, there's times where a stock has 10 red candles in a row, has one green candle, and then keeps, keeps panicking, goes down another 10 red candles in a row. If you hold into that, you're gonna get absolutely screwed and be unprofitable as a trader. There's manipulation. There's market makers who it's their job to you know, make the stock go up because they're doing some sketchy stuff and they have a billion shares that they're trying to unload to the market. You gotta be careful of stuff like that. I have videos talking about that as well. Slow executions, again, it makes it really difficult. So say you, know, you wanna buy, say, say you see this first green candle right here and you're like, oh man, this thing is gonna go up. I see this little green candle, I think it's gonna go up, I buy here. And then it doesn't go up and you wanna sell, you might sell and you might not get filled until down here if you sold here. So there's a lot of slippage. Slippage is where you sell and you end up getting a way worse price than what it actually was trading at when you sold. That happens a lot on OTC stocks. So you gotta be really careful of that and size in accordingly. And uh, the biggest thing that you're trying to overcome is human nature. There's a lot of psychological issues that we have when dealing with money that make it very hard to overcome our inner nature and be profitable traders. It's very hard to mix money and emotions. And you, to be a profitable trader, you have to think like a robot, which is really tough sometimes. They say that 95% of day traders are unprofitable, and there's a reason for that. Most people do not have the discipline necessary to overcome what human emotions and psychology are trying to drive you to do. So why does so many fail, and how can you be different? Well, again, it's human psychology. You don't want to be wrong. You don't want to admit that you're wrong. We're very loss averse, and if you buy a stock and it goes down, you don't want to sell that stock and realize a loss. Realizing is when you take an unrealized, I guess, let me explain unrealized. So unrealized is, say I buy a stock at 250 and it goes down to 240. I have an unrealized loss of 10 cents a share. Unrealized means it's not realized yet. It could go back up and I would sell at 255 and I could have made five profit, you know, five cents profit. But once you realize it, once you sell it, it means it's locked in. So unrealized profits really mean nothing until you sell them and lock them in. Just keep that in mind. So people don't like to admit that they're wrong. They don't like to realize their losses. So they just end up holding on and letting the stock go lower and lower and lower. And the lower it goes, the less likely they are to want to sell and lock in those losses. Because they're like, shoot, I could have sold here at 240 and now it's at 190. I don't want to sell at 190 and take a huge loss. So I'm just going to wait and wait for it to go back up. A lot of these sketchy companies never go back up. They never go back up. So you just got to keep that in mind. So the biggest rule that I have, literally my number one rule is, if a trade goes against you, get out. If you buy a stock thinking it's bouncing and it starts going down even further, sell it. Get out of that, man. Or if you buy a stock and it goes up here and then it starts coming back down, sell it. Take tiny profits. Tiny profits are better than a loss. Literally, as soon as a trade goes against me, I sell it. I'm out. Bye-bye. That's why I like OTC stocks, because they're a lot cleaner and this strategy works. If you try to trade a NASDAQ stock and sell as soon as it goes against you, you're not going to be able to hold long enough to make any type of profits. So it doesn't really work. What else? Emotions. Again, it's so difficult to overcome human emotions. You guys really have to be disciplined to do that. Also, gambling. People like to, you know, just throw in some money and, and say, oh, I'm going to hope it goes up. That's not going to work. You need to have a statistical advantage. You need to only take the best plays where it's actually statistically proven that it's likely to go up from here. And if you're wrong, again, sell and get out. It's fine to have little losses. If you take a $10 loss, a $50 loss here and there, but you're making $1,000 when you're right, it doesn't matter, man. You can be wrong a lot more than you're right because your winners are going to more than make up for your losses. But if you have a, a $10,000 loss, a $15,000 loss, it's a lot harder to make up for that. It's a lot harder. One big loss can destroy you. There's a lot of laziness. A lot of people are not willing to put in the work. They're not willing to study these patterns. They're not willing to, to learn about stocks. They're not willing to put the hours in front of the computer to, to really learn and understand how everything works. So they lose because of that. Laziness, a lot of people are not willing to work hard enough. Lack of knowledge, that's another thing you have to overcome. And giving up too soon. A lot of people, I don't know if you've seen that, that picture. I probably can't find it, but like one dude was digging for diamonds and he turned around just before he broke through and found all the diamonds. And the other dude was going straight ahead, full steam ahead, and he's not gonna give up till he finds the diamonds. Like, your diamond could be the next day. It could be next week. It took me a long time. I started day trading five years ago, and this is my best month ever. I wasn't really profitable until pretty recently when I had a breakthrough. Pretty recently when I got my psychology under control and started focusing on the best setups. So if you're a beginner and you wanna be profitable, you have to know 
that you might need to stick with it for a while. It could take a couple of years. Would it be worth it if you could be making 5K a day at the end of that? I think it would, but most people are not willing to stick with something and fail for that long. They're just not. And uh, let's see, what else? Blowing up your account, that's probably the, 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 the last big thing. You know, you need to make sure that you put yourself in the position where you can be in this for the long run. So if you're not managing risk and one bad trade can blow up your account, all it takes is one bad trade and suddenly you can't trade anymore, you're not gonna be in this long enough to really give yourself a chance to even be successful. So that's why I really recommend guys, manage your risk. If a stock goes against you, sell it, get out of that. There's so many opportunities in the market. There's no need to keep your money in a bad play. It's better to sell at a loss and take what money you have remaining from that and put in a better option, put in a better stock that's gonna make that money back and more. And that's how I feel about it. <clears throat> so those are the mistakes that a lot of people make. So how can you learn to trade profitably? If you're just getting started, if you're a beginner and you wanna know how you can trade profitably, how can you do it? Well, I recommend watch my videos every night. The last two months I put out a video every single day before a market open day talking about all the stocks that I'm gonna be watching, all the plays that I think are gonna happen, how I'm gonna be buying and selling every single stock. I'd always make videos about that. And I also talk about the trades I did the previous day typically in there. So if you wanna know how I'm making 4,000, 5,000 a day, watch my videos. Seriously, it's gonna be really helpful for you beginners. The more you watch, the more you're gonna get this stuff ingrained in your brain and the more you're gonna understand how to think like a profitable trader. And that's ultimately the goal. Also, if you want to know how to do this, you can join the Discord that I have. I created a Discord community, which is a messaging app. And basically, what that allows you to do is be in there with over 850 people. And I'm live on the mic during market hours. I'm calling out every single play that I see. And I'm calling out when I'm buying and selling stocks. And this is not so you can copy me. This is so you can understand how I think. It's so you can start to witness the plays as they're unfolding in real time and be like, oh, weird. I didn't think like that. I didn't see that. But now that he's mentioning it, yeah. I can see why he thinks like that. I can see why he's buying here. And the more you do that, you do that for a couple months, a couple of years, it's gonna start to get ingrained in your brain. You're gonna be self-sufficient. You're gonna be able to do that on your own. So I definitely recommend checking that out. The link's in the description for my Discord. And uh, yeah, I mean, I recommend always starting with tiny size. So if you wanna be profitable, but you have no knowledge, don't go in trading $1,000 positions because you're gonna end up taking some big losses. Trade $50 positions, trade $10 positions. And if you trade at a zero, uh, zero commission brokerage like Fidelity, you're not gonna have any commissions on that. So it's not gonna eat into your profits if you're trading with $10 size, which is incredible. So I recommend starting with tiny size. You can paper trade. Paper trading is fake trading, fading, trading in a small, uh, not a small account, trading in a fake account. But I don't recommend that because there's no actual emotion attached to it. And dealing with emotion is the most important part of trading. Trading is, is putting real money on the line. And if you're trading in a paper trading account, which is fake money, it literally is just not trading. You're not practicing trading. So I recommend starting with small size and working your way up once you've proven that you're consistently profitable. That's the only way to do it. Once you've proven that you can be disciplined in cutting your losses, once you've proven that you, you have an advantage over the market statistically. I've made 100 trades this month. Uh, this is an example. Say I've made 100 trades this month, 60 of them were profitable. And the winners were twice as big as the losers. Okay, that's great. Now you can scale up your account. But don't go diving in with $1,000 positions, $10,000 positions when you have no idea what you're doing. You're just gonna lose money. The most important thing is maintaining your capital and staying in this for the long run. That's the most important thing. And uh, again, the most important thing besides that is getting over the PDT rule. And I think I mentioned this already. Again, I have a whole video dedicated to this, so definitely check that out. I have a whole playlist actually, uh, stocks, stock, free stock trading course for beginners. So. Definitely watch all the videos in there. Um, but basically, you need to get over that PDT rule because this will allow you to have that power of exponential growth. The power of exponential growth is insane. Once you get over $25,000, you can put in a million dollars in the market every day because you buy 25, you sell 25. You buy 25, you sell 25. Say there's 10 of these opportunities in a day. You can nail every single one of them with 25,000 full size. I mean, that's insane. That really starts to add up. So you need to get over PDT, that's the most important thing. And uh, again, once you start getting that, it really adds up. If you buy, oh gosh, I mean 1,000 shares, 175, say 10,000 shares, that's, a, that's 11,750 11, bucks. You sell it here, 23,000, I mean, man, you just made, what is that? 
I mean, what, you just made 10,000 bucks? Am I tripping? No, not quite that much. 5,000 bucks in, in, in 10 minutes, bro? That's insane. And there's been a lot of plays like this. So once you get disciplined, once you get good and you can size up, it's a breeze, man. It's a breeze. And obviously there's still so many issues that you're going to have. But once you have the knowledge to overcome that, the confidence to overcome that, you're going to be set. So literally, just put in the work, guys. Watch my videos. Check out the Discord. Learn on your own. Trade with small size. Take all this stuff to heart. Focus on the best patterns. And uh, if you really want it badly enough, if you stick with it for long enough, you're going to be a profitable trader. And it's incredible. It's an incredible feeling to be able to make $80,000 in one month from your basement. I mean, that's insane, bro. It's insane. It really blows my mind. So hopefully this video was helpful. If you made it to the end, which I really doubt because it's such a long video, but if you did, please smash that like button. Please drop a comment. Please comment pork chops if you made it to the end. Or no, let's switch it up. Comment, I don't know, something else. Octopus. If you made it to the end, comment octopus. And uh, anything else? Yeah, I mean, share this video with your friends. Like it, subscribe if you haven't already. And uh, I mean, may maybe your family, maybe your dad wants to learn how to trade. Maybe your, your grandpa or your little brother. Share it with them. I really appreciate all your guys' support. If you made it to the end, I really appreciate you. And uh, yeah, that's it. That's it for this video. Hopefully you found it helpful. I'll see you in the next one. Until then, you know the drill. Let's grow better together.